more people that are going to be jumping on to join us. Um, so a couple quick uh, South Tampa Chamber Zoom housekeeping items before I introduce our sponsors today. Um, as always, once our presenters uh, begin, please uh, self-mute uh, your microphone so that we don't have background noise uh, in the back. Um, and it's up to you if you want to keep your cameras on. Karen is going to have a, a screen share presentation today, but then during the Q&A afterwards, we do encourage you to turn your camera on and participate in that conversation. Um, for those who maybe are not familiar with Zoom, a quick tutorial on the top right hand side is your speaker view, which gives you the opportunity to toggle between speaker and this Brady Bunch view that I call this. It's actually called gallery. And then on the bottom left hand side is your mute and your video camera if you need to step away and turn your camera off uh, or if you want to mute during the presentation. We are recording today's presentation, so just want to make sure that you're all aware um, that we are doing that. And we encourage you during the presentation to use the group chat. So if you would like to communicate with Karen or myself, you can send us a private message. You can also click everyone and that's going to allow your message to show to the group. We encourage you to drop your name, contact information and company information in there as part of your networking experience today. And at the end of the presentation, you can click the three little dots on the right hand side and that will allow you to download the chat so that you have everyone's contact information to take with you and follow up. Uh, I am Kelly Flannery. I'm the very proud president and CEO of the South Tampa Chamber. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much to our speaker today, Karen with Ackerman Law for coming back to join us for the second time this year um, as we all continue to navigate this truly unusual time um, and understanding the unique challenges that businesses and business owners are, have been currently facing and will be facing moving forward. Uh, before we turn it over to Karen, I want to also say thank you to our not one but two sponsors today. So incredibly grateful for both of you. Um, and I'm going to start by introducing Missy Martin. Uh, she's the owner of Roche Surety and she's going to share with you a little bit about their business. Mute. Mute. Missy, you're muted. Is that better? Yep. Yeah. Sorry about that. Hey, Kelly. Um, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you to the South Tampa Chamber for the opportunity to sponsor this event. I'm Missy Martin with Rocha Surety and Casualty Company. We're a family-owned um, national insurance carrier, not an agency, but an actual insurance company. We do business in 41 states, including the federal registry. We specialize in surety bonds of all types, including those that some of your businesses or clients might require. Um, so if you or any of your clients need a surety bond, we're here and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Missy. And our second sponsor today, Shane Smith, and he is with the Jim Moran Institute for Global Entrepreneurship. Say that three times fast. Um, and I'm currently a student in their class. So there's my little remember, remember shout out uh, to Shane and his program. But Shane, share with us a little bit about what's happening over uh, with you and your, and your group this year. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, I am the Central Florida Director for JMI, and for those that don't know what JMI does, uh, the Jim Moran Institute is a statewide nonprofit programming, helping out nonprofit leaders as well as small business owners that already exist to help them get past that, those early stage uh, troubles. Uh, we do it in a classroom format, usually it's in person, uh, about 25 of us uh, in the classroom for roughly eight weeks. Uh, right now, we're finishing up a class virtually the best we can through Zoom. It's not as fun, but it's still, it's still very impactful. Um, we are, um, I'm excited because we are still moving forward with our fall programs. Uh, we're looking to possibly start in August, but we may delay the start till September. Um, we're looking for right now for both programs. Uh, so if you or anyone else you know is a nonprofit leader or a small business owner, uh, or leader themselves, I would love to speak with them and have them apply. Uh, the program, uh, if you get accepted, if you were one of the 25 for either program uh, and you get accepted, everything is at no cost to you. Um, it's uh, a, a, a simply a, a gift uh, from the late Jim Moran and his existing foundation. So uh, I'll leave my contact information if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you both so much for your support of the chamber and for today's program. We will be sending out a follow-up email uh, this afternoon or tomorrow morning and we'll include contact information for both of our sponsors as well as for Karen as well. Um, and so Shane and Missy, if you have anything additional outside of that, a link uh, to sign up or anything like that, if you want to forward that to me, I'm happy to include that for you 
uh, in that email. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Karen Busing as she's a partner at Ackerman Law. And thank you again so much, Karen, uh, for coming back to meet with us again. It is my pleasure. So I'm going to uh, share my screen with you at this point, and hopefully this is working okay. Uh, let me know if you have any issues. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about best practices for both minimizing the spread of COVID-19 and for minimizing liability for businesses. Um, you'd have to be basically sitting under a rock to not recognize that, that uh, oh, I'm having trouble advancing here. Uh, there we go. Uh, to not recognize that, that there's been a very active plaintiff's bar, which has been uh, aggressively uh, pursuing claims. Um, as you know, up in Chicago, a bunch of McDonald's uh, employees got together and got with a, uh, a lawyer who asserted a nuisance theory to get outside of workers' comp. There are all kinds of other theories. Lots of these claims out there, they are centering around a failure to provide a safe workplace, uh, discrimination claims, particularly by older workers or workers with disabilities, uh, failure to provide sick leave or family and medical leave uh, relating to COVID-19 under the FMLA or the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, retaliation of whistleblower claims, all of these things. Um, general duty to provide a safe workplace. Everybody, all employers have a general duty under OSHA to provide a safe workplace. And so if you are doing that, workers' compensation should cover claims relating to work-related illness or injury. But you can get around that. And so the plaintiff's bar has been very aggressively um, working on ways to get around that. And if you can establish that a company was reckless or engaged in intentional conduct or simply didn't follow the basic standards, then there's liability. And so the best practice to avoid that is to demonstrate compliance with federal, state, and local guidance. So um, with respect to customers, uh, there's a whole different set of issues. You've got employees and then you've got customers and there are lots of potential customer claims out there again because businesses have a general duty of care to customers to protect them from a foreseeable harm. It's a little different standard than the employee standard. Generally, while there's no duty to someone with whom you don't have a relationship, although there are some kinds of specific ones where there are them, um, it, it, the standard is whether the harm that would result from the business's failure to act was reasonably foreseeable. So did the business have an opportunity to warn of the harm or to take steps to protect its customers? Once the, a lawyer establishes that there's a duty of care, did the business breach that duty? And if so, was that breach the cause of the injuries? And what's the business's obligation in this setting we're living in today to warn about past exposures to COVID-19 at, at the site or to protect present, present or future employees or customers or even strangers from exposure? This is all really new, uh, a new area we're navigating. So the best thing you can do right now to avoid claims or to minimize your liability for claims is to make sure that you're following state, federal, and local guidance. I'm going to start at the top with the CDC. Back in May, the CDC said you need to adopt a plan. The plan has to be specific to your workplace. It's got to identify all areas and job tasks with potential exposures to COVID-19. Identify the measures you're going to use to eliminate or reduce those exposures. The plan is also supposed to prevent and reduce transmission among employees, maintain healthy business operations, and maintain a work, healthy work environment. So the bottom line back in May was the CDC is saying adopt a plan. Since that time, they've issued a lot of guidance with very, very specific uh, recommendations, because nothing from the CDC is a regulation, but very specific recommendations for all different kinds of industries, from restaurants and bars to small businesses, child care facilities, parks and recreational facilities, apartment communities, all kinds of different businesses, very specific guidance. So whatever your industry is, you should be looking at that at the CDC guidance at the top. Uh, this is a sample page from one of their, their, uh, their pages on, on what employers should be doing to protect their businesses and their employees. In addition to the CDC guidance, you've got OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And again, back in March, 
The, C, the uh, OSHA said you should develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. So right back in the beginning, OSHA is saying develop a plan. CDC is saying develop a plan. Then in June, uh, OSHA issued some additional guidance, which was much more detailed, kind of geared toward reopening. One of the things they said is you've got to conduct a hazard assessment for each job category, outline the protective measures, and conduct health screenings. So a hazard assessment is kind of a big fancy word for saying, look at your employees and figure out who's got exposure and what you can do to reduce that exposure. OSHA issued specific guidance on reopening in June of 2018. And they said, again, employers should implement strategies that are appropriate for the specific workplace and for the phase of reopening that you're in. Again, determining when, where, and how employees might be exposed establishing basic hygiene and making sure you post signs about it, establishing cleaning and uh, disinfection procedures, making sure you've got uh, warnings in place about social distancing, having a policy for identification and isolation of sick employees and for return after illness and exposure, and other workplace controls and flexibilities. Um, they're looking at engineering and administrative controls. Both CDC and OSHA are talking about looking at your HVAC systems and making sure that, that things are filtered as best they can be. And of course, having personal protective equipment. Um, workplace flexibilities around telework and sick leave. And we're going to talk more about the FFCRA in a little bit and the leave issues there. In addition, OSHA says you should be training your employees, so does CDC, on the signs, symptoms, and risk factors associated with COVID-19 and how to prevent its spread. You're supposed to train your employees on your plan as well. And that you should have anti-retaliation policies that ensure no adverse action is taken against an employee who raises a workplace safety or health issue. And that's really important. Keep in mind that state and local emergency orders or executive orders vary significantly. Compliance with one does not necessarily indicate compliance with another. I did a COVID-19 plan for a business down in Miami. Miami has to comply with both the city of Miami order and the Miami-Dade County order. One of them says you have to screen employees and ban anybody whose temperature is in excess of 99.5. The other says 104 or higher. So you really, really have to pay attention to the local guidance as well. So what's in a COVID plan? Number one, you should identify a COVID monitor. You can call them whatever you want, but you need to have a contact person who's in charge of sort of monitoring the guidance and letting employees know when things change or someone they can go to if they have a question. You should conduct a hazard assessment of each job. Again, both OSHA and CDC talk about this. That's a, just a fancy way of saying, look at who's gonna be exposed and how and figure out what you can do to minimize that exposure. You need your, your plan needs to identify safety protocols that you're using, uh, masks, uh, marking off sinks, uh, limiting people in, uh, in office, uh, like gathering rooms, those kinds of things. You need to provide training and then my recommendation is that you need to have them acknowledge receipt of the plan and an obligation to report to you if they become, become aware of a safety issue. Because just like in the context of a harassment or discrimination claim, if you don't know about it, you can't really act on it. And so you want to get your employees to acknowledge that they have an obligation to let you know if they become aware of an issue. And the best way to do that is to have them sign off that they've received a copy of your plan, read it, and understand they have an obligation to let you know if they spot an issue. Your COVID plan protocols should address all of the CDC and OSHA guidance, again, looking specifically at your industry if you're in one where there is specific guidance. Everybody should be doing pre-arrival screening for symptoms right now. And I wanna note that the CDC changed the symptoms last week. They keep changing the symptoms. Um, uh, you should also have social distancing strategies in place and, of course, cleaning and disinfection uh, strategies. And they have requirements around, and I'm saying requirements, they have recommendations around the kinds of chemicals and um, that you should be using for these things. So there are a lot of different daily health screening questions out there. Um, 
the, the latest set of symptoms includes all of these fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle, body aches, headache, new loss of uh, taste, smell, all of these things. Those symptoms do keep changing, so keep that in mind. But what we recommend is that before someone shows up at your work site, you have them complete a self-screening where they take their temperature and they ask themselves these questions. They don't give you this information. They ask themselves these questions. You want to make sure that they can answer no to each of them. You want to make sure that if they have had contact with anyone who at the time of the contact had a confirmed uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 or had symptoms and was awaiting test results, or if they've traveled to a place like Florida, uh, which has widespread sustained community transmission or been on a cruise ship, you want to know that. Um, again, when I say have them conduct an assessment, it's really important that they do that before they come to your work site. But all they need to report to you is that they can safely answer no to each of those questions. If you collect actual medical information, such as someone's temperature or medical or symptoms that they're experiencing, you need to be aware that you have a federal obligation under the law to maintain that information as confidential in a separate medical file. It cannot be a part of your personnel files. It's got to be separately maintained. And whoever is getting that information needs to be trained regarding their obligations to maintain the confidentiality of that information under the Americans with Disabilities Act. I'm speaking in the context of a non-healthcare provider right now. Healthcare providers have some additional obligations, particularly with respect to employees for whom they also provide medical treatment. But all information uh, regarding parents or students, if you're running a school, also must, has to be maintained in confidential files. Bottom line, don't retain medical information that you don't need. It's just not a good idea. You should definitely adopt rules for how you're going to handle illness. You want to discourage employees who have symptoms related to COVID-19 to come to work because they're going to spread it if they do. So please take steps to discourage people. Um, and then don't allow people to return to work until they meet the appropriate CDC return criteria. I can't go into that for you today because every time I turn around, they change that criteria. So pay very close attention to that um, and keep in mind one critical factor. The incubation period for this virus is 14 days. So I can come down with symptoms on day three and be tested. I can have a negative test and I can still test positive for it on day 14. Uh, I can have no symptoms, but be with someone who has it. Go get tested and again on day three or day four, I may have a negative test. I may have a positive one on day 11. It's a 14 day incubation period. So keep that in mind as you're dealing with these issues. Again, once you've got your plan adopted, I would encourage you to share it with your employees um, let them know it's a living document. It's going to keep changing because, again, the, the federal, state, and local guidance keeps changing. So do include a separate page and acknowledgement, just like you do with an employee handbook where they acknowledge that they've reviewed it, they agree to follow the protocols, they're going to do their self-screening, they're going to notify you of any safety issues, all of those things. Have your employees sign an acknowledgement of the plan and their obligations. That is not the same as asking them to sign a waiver. You do not want to ask employees to sign a waiver of their rights. They have rights to a safe workplace under OSHA. Uh, they have rights um, to, to talk about their terms and conditions of employment. You don't want to violate their rights. So you want to make sure that, that you are having them sign an acknowledgement simply of their obligations to do their screening, to follow your rules with respect to COVID-19, and to let you know if they become aware of any safety issue. Um, now, if you're in the kind of a business that has visitors, for example, hotels, uh, uh, many hotels or gyms, fitness centers, uh, to the extent they're open, the kinds of facilities that have regular visitors, you might want to consider having a participation agreement, waiver, and release agreement. And again, think of uh, dangerous activities like skydiving or those things where a boat takes you across in the sky and parasailing. Um, or, or gyms. Uh, these documents can be a, a simple one-page document in uh, plain English advising people very clearly 
of their COVID-19 obligations. You know, you've got to wear a mask or observe social distancing. You've got to wipe down the equipment before and after use, whatever your obligations are for your particular work site. Have them uh, identify and acknowledge that there are risks of illness or injury from being at the site. If you're at a gym, obviously there are going to be risks of illness or injury. Have them expressly waive any claims and release the owners and operators and employees from any cause of action arising as a result of their participating in your programs or using your facilities. Do include an express reference to COVID-19 and to waiving claims re re regarding COVID-19 and an express acknowledgement of the assumption of risk. Again, this is for visitors who want to use your facilities or participate in things where there are associated risks. And not every business is going to want to do this because it can turn some people off. Many hotels are doing it because when you book a hotel, you do an online terms and conditions and it's, you know, a ton of boilerplate and it's right in there for, for those kinds of things. Uh, very common in uh, gyms, fitness centers, skydiving, any kind of activity like that. So you've got to think about your industry and whether this is going to turn off your customers or whether it's going to be okay. The other thing to keep in mind is that even if you have such a waiver, it may not be enforceable. Courts don't like waivers. They're going to scrutinize them very carefully. They're going to try to figure out whether they were in fact knowing and voluntary. And Importantly, a waiver will not release an operator from intentional or reckless conduct. So again, what does that mean? Keep that in mind. That means your best practice to make sure you can establish you weren't engaging in intentional or reckless conduct. Your best practice is to be sure you are following the federal, state, and local guidance. And I want to emphasize local again because uh, many areas, although not, not really Tampa, but many areas do have very, very specific local guidance that you need to be following. Let's talk real briefly about exposures in the workplace. Um, again, if you have an employee who has COVID-19 symptoms, you should direct them not to report to work and they should consult their doctor. Uh, also, if employees have had close contact and that under current CDC guidance means within six feet for 15 minutes or more, with anybody who at that time of the contact had a confirmed case or had symptoms and was awaiting test results, they should not report to work. They should only be permitted to work when they meet the CDC return to work criteria. And that varies depending on whether they had symptoms, didn't have symptoms, whether they were hospitalized, weren't hospitalized. Um, it, it is very significantly variable. So I can't just recite that for you. Um, you are supposed to be reporting positive test results to local health authorities. Again, that varies county by county. Some places that is apparently not the case, um, but you are supposed to do that. But you should never, ever, ever disclose the name of a positive individual to anybody other than health authorities unless that individual consents in writing. So a lot of times you will have to say, okay, here's somebody has come down with it. They were in close contact with four or five other individuals during that period of time when they had, uh, when they were contagious, which also just changed last week by the CDC. But some period of time before they displayed symptoms, they were actually contagious. Um, if you have to notify coworkers or others to whom they were exposed, you cannot use the, the COVID positive individual's name unless they expressly consent. And I would recommend you get that consent in writing because it's very confidential. Now, what you'll find, I think, and what we are generally finding is that most, um, most employees are concerned enough about their coworkers that they're willing to say, yeah, go on ahead and tell them that it was me. Um, if you learn that somebody is tested positive, uh, you need to confirm with everybody that they had close contact with in the confirmed positive employee in that time period, again, uh, commencing 48 hours before the onset of symptoms. I think on Friday they changed that, uh, that 48 hour period. Um, so again, keep in mind the, the CDC uh, guidance may change. And again, you should direct those who had close contact with the confirmed positive individual to self-quarantine for 14 days from the date of close contact with the employee or in accordance with other CDC guidance. So as I mentioned, they have different standards for return to work depending on symptoms and the circumstances, and it does keep on changing. 
Um, one of the things that we recommend, I'm an employment lawyer by trade, I represent businesses, is that we require employees to submit a doctor's note confirming the person doesn't have COVID-19 and releasing them to return to work in writing. But as you know, in this particular era, it is entirely possible that a doctor's office is overwhelmed and cannot in fact provide that. So that you gotta be flexible on that front and decide whether you wanna take that position or not. If you wanna require employees, you certainly can. Uh, you don't have to under CDC guidance. CDC guidance, in fact, discourages you from requiring people to do that because they're concerned about overloading the healthcare system. Um, again, you should not allow employees to return to work until they either meet the CDC criteria for ending isolation or um, if, you know, or a doctor confirms that the cause of their symptoms is not COVID-19 and releases them to work in writing. Okay, let me switch, uh, switch topics real briefly here, and we'll go to the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. I'm sure all of you have heard of this. Um, Congress decided that businesses with fewer than 50 employees, excuse me, fewer than 500 employees and certain government employers are going to be required to provide paid leave to eligible employees. There are two different kinds of paid leave covered by this statute. There's emergency paid sick leave and there's expanded family and medical leave. And small businesses with fewer than 50 employees may qualify for exemption from the requirement to provide leave um, due to school closings or childcare unavail unavailability. I'm gonna call that loss of childcare. Um, if the leave requirements would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. But that does not excuse the business from providing the required leave for any other qualifying reason. It's only for reasons relating to loss of childcare that the small business exemption would come into play. There is a separate exemption for healthcare providers and emergency responders, and we can talk about that later if, that, if anyone on the call is interested in that. Um, so the, I'm going to talk about the first bucket first, the emergency paid sick leave. So for full-time employees, this is uh, two weeks, up to 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave at their regular rate of pay where the employee is unable to work or telework. They have to also be unable to telework. So if you're in an office setting where people could telework and uh, they, they don't, they're not entitled to the, to the leave. But there are six reasons, really only five, I'm gonna explain that, but the first three are the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order relating to COVID-19. This is not your policy that if you go to South Carolina or Myrtle Beach for two, that you have to uh, quarantine for two weeks. That's your policy, that is not a government order. That does not entitle to somebody, somebody to pay emergency paid sick leave. Uh, alternatively, if the employee has been advised to self-quarantine by a health care provider due to concerns related to COVID-19, or if the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking a medical diagnosis. So if the employee basically is under a quarantine order or is sick, they are going to be entitled to this emergency paid sick leave. They are also going to be entitled, reason number four, if they're caring for an individual who is either subject to a quarantine or isolation order, or uh, the, the person is caring for a son or daughter, if the school or place of child, uh, place of care of the child has been closed or the child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions. And then number six doesn't really exist because the Secretary of Health and Human Services hasn't established anything. So the one that's created the most difficulty for people is number five, the employee is caring for a child due to loss of childcare. And things have been in flux as we've gone through the summer and now with school resuming, we do not know what guidance the Department of Labor is gonna offer on if a school is open, but you're not sending your child back to school, uh, whether that's gonna count or not. The DOL should be issuing guidance on that. The emergency paid sick leave bucket covers all employees of covered employers. Um, you don't have to have been there for some per, per, certain per period of time in order to be eligible for that. If you have one of the reasons specified for COVID-19 leave, you are eligible for that leave. Part-time employees are also entitled to it based on the number of hours that they would ordinarily work in a two week period. And the emergency paid sick leave is in addition to an employee's other leave entitlements. 
Then there is expanded FMLA leave. Um, expanded FMLA leave comes into play only for those employees who've been uh, employed for at least uh, 30 calendar days. And they are entitled to, in addition to that two weeks, they are entitled uh, to, to have 10 weeks of paid expanded FMLA leave at two thirds their regular rate of pay if, again, they've lost their child care. This is a really expensive proposition for a lot of businesses, and they just can't afford it. Um, it's been very, very challenging, particularly for very small employers. Keep in mind that an employee must provide notice of the need for that leave as soon as it is practicable. There is, as I mentioned, a small business exemption, and that allows an employer with fewer than 50 employees to be exempt from providing that emergency paid sick leave, again, just for the reason relating to school or daycare closure. It does not relate to if they're sick or under an isolation order or any of that. Um, and that also, again, the exemption is available from that expanded FMLA, again, for loss of childcare, when doing so would jeopardize the viability of the small business as a going concern. So to take advantage of this exemption, a small business must be able to show that providing leave for the school or childcare closure or loss of uh, childcare availability would threaten the company's viability in one of three specific ways. You've got to be able to show that the leave would result in expenses exceeding available revenues, which would cause the business to cease operating, or the absence of the particular employee requesting the leave would entail a substantial risk to the capabilities of the operations. You only have one person who does that particular job or two people who do that job. They have unique skills or responsibilities or that you wouldn't have enough other qualified workers available to perform the work needed to keep operating. So for example, if you are a small child care center and you have required ratios you must meet and somebody wants to take leave and you wouldn't have enough uh, teachers to operate under the, the uh, required ratios, you would be able to take advantage of that exemption. But you got to keep in mind, this is not a business wide exemption. You can't just say I have fewer than 50 employees, so I'm entitled to this exemption. The exemption has to be addressed with respect to specific employees um, who are requesting the leave rather than across the board. Uh, again, you can deny paid sick leave or expanded FMLA leave to otherwise eligible employee where it would cause the employer's uh, expenses and financial obligations to exceed the revenues, pose a business risk, a substantial risk, or prevent them from operating at minimum capacity. You do not have to provide anything to the Department of Labor on that. You just have to have an officer of the company make the determination, document the reasoning involved, the particular job position, and then maintain that in the company's records. Okay, so that's all of the pre-prepared material that I had for you today. Um, I, I want to remind everybody that this presentation was prepared for informational purposes only. It doesn't constitute legal advice. Um, it, this information is not provided in the course of an attorney-client uh, relationship and doesn't substitute for legal advice uh, in an attorney-client situation. It's general information, and as I said, even since I last prepared this presentation, uh, the CDC guidance changed again on Friday with respect to certain of these aspects. So. Um, okay, so at this point, Kelly, if you would like to open it up for questions, I'll mute myself. Absolutely. So when we have a few questions that came in the chat, I am going to stop recording at this point so that we make sure we have a, a room where our guests uh, feel comfortable to be able to ask those questions. Um, because this recording will be published, I want to quickly just say thank you again to Karen Busing with Ackerman Law and thank you also to our sponsors um, at Roche Surety and at Jim Ram Institute. Thank you all so very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn the recording off now um, and we will open up the room. We have a few questions in the chat and then we'll um, just uh, people can unmute and ask their questions as they'd like.